is Rebecca Lehman. I'm the director of the Associates Program here at ELI. Uh, this is the first session of our summer school series. We do this every summer. These are open to the public. Uh, they're meant to just introduce you to the major environmental statutes and regime, regimes. We're doing something a little different this year. We thought we would have a very introductory session where we would sort of try to share with you what it used to be like 40 or so or more years ago and how times have changed and NEPA is, um, well, I should go ahead and announce the name of the seminar, National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Fundamentals of Environmental Law. And so the two statutes that we're looking at today are NEPA sort of the Magna Carta of environmental law and the Endangered Species Act, of course, is another incredible... Bill of Rights. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> species. <laughs> And this will give you sort of a sense of, you know, of, of overarching sense of, you know, how, how environmental law, you know, can be looked at historically and, uh, you know, in the context of what's going on now. Uh, and we have two uh, amazing speakers today. Um, we have Dinah Baer, who was um, formal, who was general counsel to the um, Council on Environmental Equality, which ha does a lot of the NEPA work that will be discussed. And uh, John Kostiak is Vice President at, of Wildlife Conservation at the National Wildlife Federation, and he does a lot of work with the Endangered Species Act. And before I turn it over to them, I, I also asked them to talk a little bit about how they came to this point in their careers. Um, and uh, so this uh, seminar is being recorded and also videotaped. If uh, you like it or you want to refer to it later, we'll uh, keep it in our archives. Um, for those on the telephone, if you have a question, you can uh, email the question to Marsha McMurrin, and that's M-C-M-U-R-R-I-N at ELI.org. And we're using a different format for questions so that everybody can hear questions. We're, I'm going to pass out some sheets of paper. You just uh, write out your question and hand it back to me, and then John and Dinah can review them and answer them as they see fit. Um, so I believe that is all of my introductions, so I will turn it over to you. Do you want us to introduce ourselves and then do this talk? That, that sounds great. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. And to all the interns, welcome to Washington. Yes, most of your summer is going to be like this, <laughs> like it is today. <laughs> but there are many, many wonderful things here, and I hope you all have great experiences. Um, I came to Washington in 1981. I was on it, well, actually 1980. I was on a political campaign. Um, I was very interested in environmental issues. I grew up in California, spent a lot of time in the national parks, spent the summer before the oil spill at Santa Barbara um, at the University of California at Santa Barbara, uh, across from the beach, and um, ha always had a great interest in wildlife issues. Uh, I joined CEQ in 1981. Uh, as Deputy General Counsel, and I was there for 25 years. I'm still practicing law uh, for a variety of clients and also doing some teaching and consulting and on the board of several organizations, including Defenders of Wildlife, so welcome to the Defenders interns. Um, so with that, we have uh, lots of years to cover, and I'm actually going to go back briefly, very briefly, um, earlier than 40 years, so I want to get started. Uh, it's a little hard to convince all of American the history of American environmental law in 25 minutes, but um, so suffice it to say that at the beginning of the establishment of the country, um, not surprisingly, the laws were structured to incentivize opening up the country, to settle the country, to develop the natural resources, and not any particular thought and certainly no legal structure at that time for protection of natural resources or for environmental protection. Uh, other than maybe some health, municipal health uh, ordinances in terms of waste, but really the impetus was on opening up those lands, settling the lands, building, mining, logging, etc. Um, and really I think the first kind of notable wave of concern or thought about, gee, are we doing something here that we ought to be thinking about, came about the middle of the 19th century, um, starting in around the 1860s, uh, with George Perkins Marsh book, Man and Nature, or Physical Geography as Modified by Human Action. Uh, that was written in 1864. It's still in print today, and if you're interested in environmental history, you should definitely read it. Um, very influential book that got a lot of attention in academic circles and lecture circles in the United States. Um, that was followed in the next decade by John Wesley Powell's report on arid lands, 
in the West, and that was not as well received because Powell really linked uh, science with policy and with uh, the dreams of many people to continue developing the West and plowing up the plains. Believe it or not, there was this whole uh, belief that if you plow the land, the rain will follow. Um, <laughs> and uh, John Leslie Powell suggested that actually wasn't the case and that you really could not farm the West the way settlers had farmed the East and uh, cautioned against uh, the very things that he saw happening. He was widely disregarded, although certainly got a lot of attention. Um, Congress in particular, though, many members of Congress um, were very critical of him and thought he was far too much of a naysayer and um, proceeded to settle the West. Um, the first president that uh, took environment and conservation seriously on a very large scale uh, was, of course, Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, every president, I worked for, for several presidents, obviously, of both parties, um, not as a civil servant. So I had lots of interesting experiences, but w one common theme um, through every administration I worked for was that every president wants to be compared to Theodore Roosevelt mm -hmm. on a bipartisan basis. I never worked for a president who didn't give a speech um, starting with Reagan on Theodore Roosevelt Island all the way uh, through um, who didn't want to compare themselves in some way or another to Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and he did think a lot about this. This was not a trivial matter to him. And um, I'm not going to read a lot during this talk, but I did want to read a quote from a speech he gave to a remarkable conference he pulled together in the White House in 1908. He asked slash required um, every governor of the United States to come to this conference to talk about conservation issues. And at that time, he said, uh, quote, indeed, the growth of this nation by leaps and bounds makes one of the most striking and important chapters in the history of the world. Its growth has been due to the rapid development, and alas, that it should be said, to the rapid destruction of our natural resources. Nature has supplied to us in the United States, and still supplies to us, more kinds of resources in a more lavish degree than has ever been the case at any other time or with any other people. Our position in the world has been attained by the extent and thoroughness of the control we have achieved over nature, but we are more and not less dependent upon what she furnishes. Disregarding for the moment the question of moral purpose, it is safe to say that the prosperity of our people depends directly on the energy and intelligence with which our natural resources are used. It is ominously evident that these resources are in the course of rapid exhaustion. At the same time, the average man is losing touch with nature. This was really a precursor to the, you know, the whole movement about children uh, losing touch with nature. But Roosevelt saw that among everybody moving away from the wilderness and even the farms into the more urban environment. The average man does not realize the demand that he is making upon nature. So Roosevelt um, really tried to do a lot about that, and he single-handedly started the National Wildlife Refuge System. Um, he designated about 110 national forests. He used the newly passed Antiquities Act to designate 18 national monuments, many of which turned into national parks like the Grand Canyon. Uh, interestingly, if you saw a story today in the Washington Post about a speech that Secretary Gabbard is giving right now, I think, at the National Press Club, um, there are proposals to cut back on the Antiquities Act by allowing every state to veto a national monument in their state, in which case the Grand Canyon would not have ever become a national mon monument, because ironically, it was Bruce Babbitt's family who opposed it. Right. <laughs> um, the, uh, so there was this huge burst of conservation activity in the Rose uh, Theodore Roosevelt era, and then um, a kind of dying down in maintenance of that. Uh, we went through World War II, and then of course we had a tremendous boom in the housing uh, area, and new towns, suburbia, lots of new inventions, new industries and more destruction, more pollution. We had the Cuyahoga River catching on fire. We did have that beach in Santa Barbara um, washed up with oil from the, the Santa Barbara oil spill. And at the same time, 
in the 60s, um, we had an increasing amount of activism about a variety of social issues. The, the combination of the intellectual groundwork that had been laid starting in the mid-1800s, along with um, the push in the Roosevelt, the Roosevelt era, and then this uh, ever-increasing number of industrial accidents and natural resource destruction in the late 1950s started to lead to a wider call for political action to do something about this. And actually the first bill that was a NEPA-like bill was introduced in 1959 by Senator Murray from Montana. And it would have established an office in the executive office of the president which um, help the nation manage natural resources in line with certain national goals that the bill would have required. Um, that bill did not pass, but every session, congressional session after that, there was a bill which had some element of what later became the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, Senator Gaylord Nelson, who um, was uh, associated with the first Earth Day, that occurred introduced a number of bills, including a bill to establish a Council on Environmental Quality in the Executive Office of the President. For those of you who aren't particularly familiar with the administrative structure, the Executive Office or the EOP um, is the administrative entity that has, besides now CEQ, Office of Management and Budget, the Council on Economic Advisors, the Office on Science, Technology, and Policy, the U.S. Trade Representative and over the years has had other spe uh, small agencies for special purposes. Um, and so these bills kept being introduced in congressional sessions, and every single president opposed them, uh, Republican and Democrat alike. Um, they never said they were against environmental protection, but uh, they all opposed the creation of uh, what became the Council on Environmental Quality. Um, and they would today. Having spent 25 years in the EOP, I will tell you it doesn't matter whether the subject is environment or peanut butter or trade, no president institutionally likes to have Congress tell them what kind of office they have to have in the executive office of the president. So there was a very uh, strong resistance to these bills. On the other hand, uh, President Nixon, when he came into office, did uh, understand that environmental issues were going to become increasingly important. And in fact, at one point he said that if the environment would be the most important domestic issue in the 21st century, um, which may very well come true. <laughs> and probably is one way or the other. Um, so he, he understood that it was important. He understood that it was important politically, and he understood that momentum was building up in Congress um, along with a lot of the other activism focusing on the civil rights and the Vietnam War to do something about the environment. And he, what he decided to do, having looked at the history of these bills and realizing they all contained an agency within the EOP, he decided to try to preempt that by issuing an executive order that established your, your classic Washington <laughs> mechanism, the committee, <laughs> the interagency committee, which would be, um, under, or was under the executive order, a cabinet level committee composed of all the cabinet secretaries, like the secretary of the Department of the Interior and other agencies, Department of the Army, that had some responsibility for environmental or natural resource issues. Of course, there was no EPA or anything like that at that point in time. Um, but he made a big to-do about this cabinet interagency committee um, and uh, decided to oppose the passage of NEPA based on the fact that he was already addressing uh, environmental issues. Um, in the meantime, in Congress, a remarkable thing happened. And for those of you who are um, avidly reading the daily doings of our fine members up on the Hill, um, you may have a hard time imagining this, but in 1968, there was a joint Senate-House colloquium, bipartisan, on the environment. Now, the bipartisan part may be surprising en enough, but I can assure you, for those of you who haven't been around long, for the House and the Senate to even get together for anything besides a set of union speech is also fairly remarkable. But it was considered that important, and the purpose of the colloquium was to avoid committee jurisdiction turf and have a thoughtful conversation 
uh, about what we should do about this environmental issue. What came out of that colloquium was a white paper that discussed the issue, um, discussed the problem, discussed policies that might be put in place to address the problems, and proposed a number of action items, so to speak. And those action items, range, there were about seven or eight of them, and they ranged from the truly insignificant, um, the least uh, action <coughs> item was passing a joint resolution of Congress saying that environmental protection was important. And I can assure you that if that had been the only result of this effort, it would have been, the resolution would have been nicely framed in a GSA frame and hung in department and agency lobbies for about two years and then consigned to the dustbin of history and nothing would happen. Um, on the other spectra, end of the spectrum, there was a serious discussion about a constitutional amendment, and I will talk more about that uh, in a few minutes. But suffice it to say, most of the options were in between that, uh, including setting up committees, establishing committees in Congress with jurisdiction over environmental matters, and most importantly, passing something like NEPA. Um, so the same day as that white paper was published, Senator Henry Jackson, who was the major sponsor of NEPA in the Senate, uh, introduced NEPA on the floor of the Senate. And he made sure that people realized that this was not a minor or trivial bill. He introduced it by saying that what was at stake here was the survival of human beings. And in a world in which decency was possible, decency and dignity were possible, um, NEPA was well received in both the Senate and the House. Uh, Congressman Dingell, one of the last um, active members of Congress who was a major co-sponsor of NEPA, <coughs> um, held three days of hearings in May. The witness list is remarkable. There weren't, of course, a lot of professional environmentalists at the time, but you had people like Margaret Mead, the world famous anthropologist, talking about the relationship between destruction of the environment and societies. She did a lot of work in the South Pacific, and of course, you may be familiar with the, the uh, SAG of Easter Island and other uh, issues in the South Pacific. Uh, Pete Wilson, who at the time was mayor of San Diego, went on to become governor of California and a presidential candidate, was another witness. And David Brower, who did, of course, uh, become very instrumental in the Sierra Club and other environmental organizations. But um, three days of economists, anthropologists, cultural leaders, um, various government witnesses. And those government witnesses included the science advisor to President Nixon, who was set up to oppose the bill. And he explained to John Dingell, who's never an easy person to explain something if you're, to if you're opposing him, but he explained that this bill was unnecessary because President Nixon understood the importance of the environment and therefore he had established this very, very important interagency cabinet council um, and so this really wasn't necessary. And Dingell asked the hapless science advisor to read the last sentence of that executive order. And of course, the last sentence of the executive order repealed an earlier executive order that had been issued by President Lyndon Johnson on the beautification of America. Lady Bird Johnson, well known for her, her advocacy to uh, uh, declutter highways from billboard signs and to plant native wildflowers and, uh, and other native plants. And Dingle's point was that what presidents give, presidents can take away, and that the environment was important enough an important enough issue to be institutionalized at the highest levels of government um, and to be considered on a regular systematic basis, not at the whim of any individual, even if they happen to be president of the United States. So NEPA did pass with an overwhelming majority, and President Nixon did what all presidents do then. He took credit for it and signed it as his first oath of off, uh, first act of office on January 1st, 1970 at San Clemente and talked about how important this bill was and how important the environment was and how proud he was to sign it. Um, so that is how NEPA came into being. Now the purpose of NEPA, uh, believe it or not, is not to write environmental impact statements. Um, which is, yeah, I see some smiles, which is what most of you, any of you who went through law school, I know, heard the black letter rule that NEPA is a procedural statute. Um, and that's it. 
Well, the whole point of that process was to implement the policies of NEPA. Yes, the process is incredibly important, and I think the process itself has had some um, extremely substantial benefits. But what Congress really intended that process to do was to implement the policies of NEPA. And it, the pol I, if you don't read anything else about NEPA, and I'm sure some of you will spend some real time on it this summer, some of you uh, may not have an occasion to uh, work with NEPA, but do you read the policies? And I put two one-page handouts um, on the tables out there, one of which is the policies of NEPA, and the other is just a one-page kind of summary of the statute, the most important things probably being the, um, the links at the bottom of the page to the regulations and uh, the NEPA website that CEQ maintains. But um, the policies themselves are quite eloquent, quite prescient. Um, it's why, as uh, Rebecca said, the, um, the law is often called the Environmental Magna Carta for this country. Um, it talks about the responsibility of present generations to maintain the environment for future generations. Uh, it talks about a number of issues that were important then, that are important now. But it makes it clear when you read the statute as a whole, which is one of the shortest, if not the shortest, environmental law in the books, that it covers all environmental concerns, not just the ones we knew about in 1969, but the ones that we're dealing with now and the ones that we don't even know exist. Um, the process was quite deliberate because nobody um, up on the Hill thought that if you just issued a policy, uh, life would change. They realized that there had to be something that integrated these policies into the federal process of decision making. Um, but NEPA was not intended just for federal agencies. It is the case that the procedural responsibilities and requirements of NEPA adhere only to federal agencies in the executive branch. Uh, but NEPA was actually written uh, much broader than that. And you can win any trivia contest in town um, by uh, asking somebody about what's in 101C of NEPA, they'll automatically think you're thinking 102C, which is the EIS requirement, but 101C is actually a fascinating little section that used to read um, in the original draft, Congress recognizes that each person has a fundamental and an inalienable right to a healthful environment, and that each person has a responsibility to contribute to the preservation and enhancement of the environment. I mentioned earlier that there was a serious discussion about a constitutional amendment. There was. And the thinking at the time um, ultimately evolved into a direction that said, well, we're, we've got, we're still dealing with the Vietnam issue. We've got the Women's Equal Rights Amendment going through for ratification. We've never had a national environmental statute before. Let's try that first, and then we can always go back and amend the Constitution if it's decided that's needed. Um, in the course of that thinking, the fundamental rights language was dropped. Uh, but it does still say that Congress recognizes that each person should enjoy a healthful environment and that each person has a responsibility to enhance and preserve the environment. Um, most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, with the exception of a couple of law professors I'm familiar with, if you go to law school, you are going to hear that it's only a procedural law. Um, and there is a great uh, consternation on the part of a lot of NEPA fans and some of the original authors about what happened to the rest of NEPA. Um, it has been used as authority for a number of executive orders uh, and other, other kinds of things, and it's certainly been written about a lot, but it is the case that um, you cannot go to court and successfully argue that a particular agency decision is contrary to a particular policy. You could, but it would be a short-lived argument, <laughs> and uh, you would be very unlikely to be successful. Um, however, there are provisions in NEPA that specifically supplement the authority of every federal agency in the government. Uh, NEPA specifically says the policies, laws, and regulations of the, of the federal agencies shall be interpreted and administered in accordance with the policies. It supplements all the agency's authority, and it mandates a variety of things, which in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into detail about. I'm happy to answer 
uh, pro need to process questions after the program or through email or whatever. Um, and as I said, I did lay out a one, one pager. Uh, but there has been this continuing tension between the process and the policies of NEPA from a legal perspective. And if you're interested in that, this it's a rich field um, for both reading and writing uh, various law review articles. There were some early cases in the 1970s where courts attempted to uh, interpret the policy <coughs> mandates through the lens of the Administrative Procedures Act, which is the vehicle for litigation under NEPA. Um, and to try and interpret what is essentially arbitrary and capricious through those particular policies. Um, and there was actually a split in the circuits on that. Uh, that came to an end in 1978 in a case called uh, Vermont Yankee versus uh, Natural Resources Defense Council where the Supreme Court acknowledged that NEPA set four substantive goals for the nation, um, but said that it held that its mandate to the agencies was essentially procedural. And uh, ever since then, the emphasis uh, in a litigation context has certainly been on um, implementing the process of NEPA. And as I said, the process of NEPA is not to be underrated. Um, it, uh, it was interesting to me in my last few years at CEQ, it became increasingly clear that most people who were starting their careers took for granted the fact that a federal agency had to say what they were going to do in advance and had to make a certain amount of information public. Well, that never used to be the case. It was a combination of NEPA and the Freedom of Information Act that um, prevented a scenario which had been the norm up until then, which is you could just wake up in the morning and discover that the highway administration was building a highway in front of your house. Um, if they were actually taking your land, they'd have to tell you about it, but otherwise, really no obligation to at all, um, or lots of other federal actions. Uh, it was really the combination of these two laws that changed that scenario. And it has changed a lot of things around the world. NEPA has been copied in some part or another by about 85, somewhere between 85 and 100 countries. Um, in some cases, those countries have gone beyond uh, the legal interpretation of NEPA in the United States. For example, there is a Supreme Court case from the Philippines holding that uh, their NEPA-like provision um, which includes the language about future generations actually meant that you can't clear cut the rest of the forest because you have to keep those forests for future generations. That's not an interpretation that's ever been accepted by a, an American court. Um, but it has opened up decision making essentially to um, not only the public but state and local and tribal governments. It has really changed the way I think um, safe to say that the federal government is done business. And in the interest of time, I we'll turn to the Endangered Species Act. Thanks, Di. Well, that was a fascinating ride through history. Yeah, we'll, take a look. we'll take a brief uh, break of what we said at the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, good. And uh, it would be fascinating for us to hear how you came to where you are presently employed. And okay. Uh, well, my life story in 30 seconds or less. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, and despite New Jersey's reputation, I actually feel like I had a lot of great nature experiences as a kid, and I really think it was formative for me. Uh, a lot of time hiking and exploring the creeks near my house and fishing and kayaking and canoeing. And, uh, and of course, it was the Jersey Shore, which now is famous. Uh, so, and then I went to uh, undergrad and law school, and somewhere around law school I decided, I, I knew it when I went to law school I wanted to work for some kind of public interest cause, and around law school, uh, environment really uh, stuck out in my mind as a great project. And so for the next seven or so years after that, um, I was a uh, volunteer uh, or an uh, environmentalist uh, without... Uh, anybody paying me to do so. Uh, I worked for a federal judge for a couple of years and I worked for a large uh, private law firm here in DC for about five and a half years and all throughout that time I was also a volunteer with the Sierra Club and uh, you know, it's not hard to get important titles like conservation chair and legal chair and, um, but I also did a bunch of pro bono environmental cases and so by the time I was ready to make the leap into the nonprofit world I had a pretty good network of contacts in the conservation world and uh, so I arrived at National Wildlife Federation many moons ago, back in 1994. I've worn a lot of different hats since then. Um, uh, endangered species advocacy has been one of the common threads, uh, but I've also started a smart growth program. I worked on invasive species and uh, 
Uh, in the past four or five years, I've led our strategic initiative to essentially update our wildlife and habitat work to deal with the climate change. Um, and most recently, I, I, I was given the job of vice president to oversee all our wildlife and habitat advocacy. Um, and so uh, there's probably lots to be said about that. That's enough for now. And when we have our questions and answers, if you have any questions for me about that route, I'm happy to answer them. But let me get into my talk. We're going to talk about the Endangered Species Act mostly. I'm going to uh, do something a little bit similar to Dinah. We were asked to sort of give some historical perspective. So I'm going to, sort of, throughout the course of my talk, talk about sort of then and now, when we enacted the Endangered Species Act, where we're at today, and then a fair amount of looking into the future and, and inquiring into whether the tools that we created back in the early 1970s are adequate to the task today. Um, let's see if this arrow works for me. Maybe down arrow? not working for me. Oh, it's working. I hope it's not going to think throughout my talk. I always think of Bill Gates when I see that little arrow. All right, we need to get it back into the view. Slideshow view, right? Sorry, folks. Resume slideshow. Thank you. Okay. Um, so 1973 was the year the Endangered Species Act was passed. I'm not going to go into the kind of depth of history that Dinah did for this law, but I, I do think it's important to highlight that um, there was a pretty good understanding on the part of Congress at the time it was passed. And by the way, this law, like NEPA, was passed with large majorities, 99 to 0 in the Senate, just to give you a sense for the kind of support uh, these laws had back in those days. Uh, a pretty broad recognition, uh, all the leaders who were moved this uh, statute through, and no dispute that uh, there was an extinction crisis underway, that people were largely responsible for it. Um, a clear understanding, as there was with NEPA, about the linkage between uh, species conservation and our quality of life. There's a discussion of the importance of species conservation for medicinal uses and a whole host of other benefits. And, uh, and this is going to be a theme throughout my talk, a clear understanding from the beginning that to save a species, you need to save its habitat. You need to be connected to ecosystems. And so one of the stated purposes in Section 2 of the Endangered Species Act is to conserve the ecosystems on which threatened and endangered species depend. Very important concept as the law has been implemented over the years because you find that most of the most important actions taken under this law have been essentially land use and water use uh, protection measures. Uh, and those also have been the reason the law is one of the more controversial statutes because it has some powerful impacts on how people use the land and water. So back in 1973, what were we talking about? Well, climate change, which is the hot topic of the moment, was not discussed at all. Uh, the big threats that Congress put in the statute as sort of the reasons for concern, habitat destruction, overutilization, which means usually over-harvesting of species, uh, uh, disease. Um, but Congress did, as with NEPA, make it pretty clear that it was not going to try to anticipate every single threat to species, but to give the agencies implementing the statute uh, the power to address any threat that might arise uh, that would threaten the existence of a species, uh, and, and deciding whether to protect the, the statute and taking actions once a species is uh, listed as threatened or endangered. So in its 20, oh, I'm sorry, 30, uh, I should be able to do the math by now. 30-something years of history, uh, 38 years. Um, we have pretty significant accomplishments. I'm going to focus primarily on domestic species today because the law only has limited um, uh, powers over foreign species, mainly dealing with imports uh, of species into this country. Um, so the main uh, focus of activity over the years has been on those domestic species. And so we have over 1,400 species uh, that have received some kind of attention from our federal government. And when the federal government is paying attention, it spurs a whole bunch of activity on the part of states and private actors and NGOs. Um, and uh, as a result of identifying and listing those species for as threatened or endangered, millions of acres of habitats have received some kind of conservation benefit. Um, and those benefits, of course, then ex extend out to people in the economy, recreational opportunities, uh, filtration, storage of fresh water, flood protection, all those so-called ecosystem services uh, we can attribute to, uh, in part, to Endangered Species Act protections. Well, we're sometimes often forgotten is how some of the most treasured, the most iconic species in this country uh, were heading toward extinction. And it wasn't really until the Endangered Species Act uh, provided that sort of stopgap measure uh, 
uh, that we were able to rescue them and reverse the trends. So species such as the Florida panther um, and the bald eagle and the American alligator and the gray wolf and the Yellowstone grizzly, whooping crane, the list goes on of uh, really the, not, the icons are sort of the symbols of what makes this country, I think, unique. Uh, we're all threatened uh, decades ago, and it was because of the Endangered Species Act that are still here today. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of you have traveled abroad or come from other countries, but uh, uh, sometimes when I travel abroad, I realize how much we have been blessed in this country with a rich uh, natural heritage. It's not something that every country has. And countries that have been through lots of traumas over the years, one of the first things to take a hit is the biodiversity. Uh, food supply, for example, if you have a starving country, uh, they're going to go after anything that moves. And so when you think about uh, all the traumas this country has been through, obviously not as severe as some others, but uh, the fact that we have prioritized uh, uh, our natural heritage, I think, is a very significant accomplishment. And the Endangered Species Act, I've sometimes referred to as one of the, more law the most moral laws we've ever passed because we're able to have the foresight and understand that it, uh, although there might be some short-term benefits to harvesting or destroying the habitats of these species, we have so many long-term benefits for ourselves and for our, our future generations. So what I want to do mostly today is sort of look back on what we had and what, what got us these benefits today, these tools, and then think uh, with you about whether they're up to meeting today's conservation challenges. Um, so let's just do a little bit of a picture of where we're at today with wildlife. Certainly the endangerment uh, crisis that uh, motivated Congress to act into 1993 has not gone away. Um, uh, various studies have been produced in terms of uh, different taxa and uh, their uh, uh, level of endangerment. Uh, two recent ones, one on plants and one on carnivores, you know, gives you a flavor. This is worldwide studies, uh, but you can see very large percentage of the natural heritage in this country and a world around the world uh, endangered by habitat destruction and those kinds of pressures, even without factoring in climate change. And you've all probably seen the statistics that came out with the IPCC back in 2007 that basically says, we, with what is now seen as a very plausible mid-range warming scenario of 3.6 Fahrenheit uh, this century, we have you know, roughly a third, quarter to a third of the species around the world that will be at uh, enhanced risk of extinction. So. One of the key themes I hope to talk to you about today is how what was generally framed in 1973 as a species issue or a wildlife issue today is um, uh, not, it's not accurate to discuss, I mean, unless you are immediately shift from discussing this species is endangered and therefore it is a symbol for a much larger problem. It is not necessarily helpful to talk about an endangered species as just an endangered species issue. All uh, uh, the general problems we face with species are not somebody pointing a gun at a species and harvesting it. It is a uh, uh, system uh, either crash or system in under severe stress. And so just to give you a little flavor of what we're dealing with on the Endangered Species Act, but every major conservation statute, uh, what I consider to be systemic crashes. Uh, we have, of course, where the most extreme uh, uh, climate change is happening up in the poles, uh, glaciers and polar ice caps melting, uh, sea level rise, and, 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 uh, and in many places, land loss on the coasts. Uh, uh, coastal communities, both natural and human, are being deluged by storm surge. Uh, I'm not going to read all this too, but you get the flavor. Uh, we have uh, places that are, uh, in effect, in some places, becoming uninhabitable to key species as well as potentially to people. Uh, certainly the recent nuclear crisis in uh, Japan uh, gives another example of how, how we can essentially declare large areas essentially as uninhabitable. Uh, so that, that changes, in my mind, the endangered species debate in pretty fundamental ways. So it's uh, helpful for me to go back to the early 1970s and think about what were sort of the, the seminal papers to help us understand the environmental crisis. And there was a really good one that came out from Paul Ehrlich and uh, today's uh, president's uh, science advisor, John Holdren, uh, that essentially boil it down in a way that uh, it has been a pretty accepted uh, terminology ever since in terms of three fundamental causes, three fundamental measures of, of, of human impact on the environment, our environmental footprint. And it boils down to three, population, affluence, and technology. They refer to it as their PAT formula. Uh, consumption is, is the equivalent of a, um, affluence. And so if you look at uh, the 50 years that have gone by since I came around and Barack Obama and many of the sort of today's uh, government leaders uh, uh, arrived around this time, what are the changes that we've experienced on those PAT formula? Well, the population is more than double. We're now it's at uh, roughly 6 billion and heading rapidly to 9 billion, as some are projecting for mid-century. Uh, on the consumption side, 
Uh, and this is, relates directly to affluence, uh, um, the fact that uh, uh, many of the uh, uh, mo poorest people around the world have suddenly risen to the middle class, which is good news, but it does have impacts. And of course, some of the richest company, uh, countries of the world have uh, overconsumed. So we have uh, statistics like tripling of food consumption, tripling of fresh water consumption, and maybe the most significant of these all, of them all, uh, the quadrupling of fossil fuel uh, consumption, which of course is one of the key contributors to climate change and ocean acidification. The other thing I really want to bring out, which doesn't get discussed often enough, but it really relates to the differences between now and 1973. In 1973 was this big flowering of environmental awareness. And the people who were around at that time, their, their childhoods involved some significant degree of na time in nature. Um, and so if you look at, uh, God, did I screw up this bar graph? I sure did. I'm sorry. That the, left, the ones on the left need to be reversed. So uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to take away that. That's just going to distract you if you try to undo that bar graph. <laughs> What you will find if you look at the data on kids' uh, time outdoors as kids in back in, uh, 25 years ago and measure it against today, that we've had a, at least a, a quintupling, five times the amount of time in front of screens, both computer as well as a TV. And the amount of time outdoors has uh, dropped, uh, is now roughly 10% or less of where we were at. So basically, and, and the, the people, and these are all averages. So mainly one out of 10 kids today actually has any time outdoors, and 90% of kids get zero. Um, really frightening statistics. And I think you, to really understand the environmental challenges we have today, in terms of updating our environmental laws, making sure there is a true conservation ethic from our, our, le our conservation leaders or societal leaders, you need to uh, start with some of the basic fundamentals. And we believe in National Wildlife Federation that if you have not had those formative experiences interacting with nature, your ability to care for it and actually work to protect it is drastically reduced. And so that is a, a, a very worrisome uh, tr a change uh, since the 1970s that we have been witnessing and trying to do something about. The other big change, of course, is global warming. Uh, which is, so at National Wildlife Foundation, we have three big priorities, protecting and restoring wildlife, uh, connecting people, uh, families with nature, and the third, uh, confronting uh, global warming. And we think it is a big game changer for wildlife. So I have to walk through real quickly some, and you know a lot of this, I'm sure, but I think it's important to frame any discussion about the Endangered Species Act, our major conservation laws, in terms of what was designed back in the early 1970s. Is it going to be adequate to the task for today? Again, start in the polar regions, and you can see this model to the left shows the rapid uh, deterioration of the summer uh, sea ice in the Arctic. Uh, what you see in the yellow was where we were at in the late 20th century. What you see in the white is where we were at as of 2007. Drastic uh, retreat uh, of that uh, polar ice cap with uh, essentially leading to a veritable collapse in that, the uh, ice-based uh, uh, ecosystem. And of course, in temperate zones, it might, it's not always in a situation of collapse. You can see what I would call more of a, uh, a system in stress. The, the longleaf pine, pine system is not gone. Uh, we've always had die-offs of longleaf pine, but you see uh, much greater number uh, uh, volumes of die-off all across the West due to the heat and, and the drying of those systems and the uh, bark beetle outbreak. And so uh, th those red trees are all dead and dying trees in Colorado. It's happening all across the Rockies as well as the Pacific Northwest. Fundamentally, with climate change, to understand its impact on wildlife and people, you need to understand hydrology. <laughs> and the, the, uh, the first thing to pay attention is what's happening to the water. Um, and so in, across the West, you have to look what's happening with the snowpack. Um, if you're in California, which, is, as you know, is a very large percentage of the population of this country, also oftentimes the drivers of environmental policy, uh, and you're trying to understand how they're going to handle the millions of additional people who will be moving in over the next decade at a time where their main way of storing fresh water, which is snowpack in the Sierras, is rapidly disappearing for them. So they think about the pressures on farming in the Central Valley, on the cities of San Francisco and L.A. and San Diego. Um, you have to wonder how biodiversity uh, will survive. It's going to be a different kind of challenge uh, than we've ever had to address before. In addition to the problem of too little water, too more, so essentially climate change leads to greater extremes on both ends uh, uh, in terms of uh, scarcity of water as well as abundance. And so um, here's an example of abundance. Uh, the, uh, greater war the greater temperatures leads to increased amounts of water vapor in the uh, uh, water over the Gulf of Mexico and, and intensity of storms. 
And so uh, the, the category three, four, and five storms are supposed to uh, are projected to be increasing uh, in number in the coming decades, and that will lead to storm surge and sea level rise. See the combination of sea level rise and these storms uh, will lead to significant storm surge. The, uh, the model to the right is what is projected to happen to one of our nearby wildlife refuges, the Blackwater in eastern Maryland, which uh, largely will be under salt water, it's turning converted from a brackish uh, coastal wetland to underwater. So one of the, I've been mostly talking about larger systems. It is important to understand what's happening at the species level. Um, some seminal work done by Camille Parmesan at the University of Texas essentially watched what was happening with the Edith Checker Spot butterfly in Southern California. And what she found uh, has proved to be the case of many other species, which is at the southern end of the range, if you're a northern hemisphere species, uh, begins to disappear. And with, essentially, this is oftentimes referred to as range shift. And that's because of the heat and the drying along that southern edge, uh, edge and uh, the mismatch between the uh, the host plant and, um, uh, drying up and when the, the, the lar larvae uh, traditionally, traditionally produce the butterfly. And so you are now seeing uh, many species whose southern uh, end of the range or the lower uh, portion of the slope of the range on, on an elevated slope is disappearing as a result of changing temperatures. Uh, so there, so that's, the, that's the portion that has largely disappeared for the eastern checker spot butter, butterfly. And so the real question is, what do you do when a range of a species shifts as a result of climate? And, and you look in the historical record, I mean, species typically are mobile to some extent, or at least a large number of species are mobile. Um, and so the real question is, can the species keep up with the shifting climates? A paper that came out at the end of last year uh, measured the speed by which the climates were moving toward the poles, temp these climate envelopes uh, were moving toward the poles. And the average that, that this paper found is that climates are moving today at an uh, average of roughly 27 to 45 feet per day. Now I go back to the fossil record and say, well, have plants been able to move at that pace? Uh, and the, the history shows that uh, no, in, in, uh, all the fossil record shows movements at the pace of roughly 9 to 13 feet per day in response to climatic shifts. And so major questions about how species are going to sh keep up with the pace of climate change. Um, this is already playing out in some uh, places around the globe, raising some interesting challenges for wildlife managers. You have species arriving in places where they've never been before. The red fox has arrived in the habitat of the Arctic fox in, on Baffin Island in, Cal in Canada. And so the real question is, if you're a wildlife manager, which is the native that you're managing for? Um, and I don't have the answer to that question. Let's not forget there's a whole bunch of other species that cannot move, either because they're by nature immobile or there are barriers to movement that may be put there by nature, a gigantic lake prevents a terrestrial species from moving forward, or perhaps we've put a major highway that prevents a species from moving. And so the real question is, in that situation, what's the management strategy? If you don't move them, perhaps they can't tolerate the warmer environment and they bleach uh, as these coral species do and ultimately die off. Um, and so all kinds of questions are now coming up about translocation of species and trying to pick them up and move them to more favorable climates. So I want to talk about a little bit now about how Endangered Species Act works at the broadest high altitude level. Um, to th just to engage in a conversation with you about whether we need to think about this and other conservation tools and whether their adequacy for the challenges of, uh, of today. And um, don't know if we'll reach any conclusions, but it could be an interesting conversation. Three basic features of the Endangered Species Act are identifying the species that are at risk and their habitats protecting what remains of their populations to the extent possible, and then facilitating some kind of recovery and restoration of the species to their historic rangers. And the ultimate goal is to get to the point where species don't need the protections of the act any longer. So on that first feature, the identification feature, the two main provisions that I'm alluding to are the listing provision where the wildlife agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries Service, make a scientific judgment that the species is threatened or endangered. And then they are also required to designate a place on the map, a very specific location that is the critical habitat that is essential for the recovery of that species. So some of the big issues that come up, particularly in light of climate change, in this identification portion of the act. There's a lot more species today, as my, some of the statistics I rolled out earlier suggest, that are at risk of extinction that Congress presumably was thinking about back in the 1970s. And so the real question is, who gets to make the judgment about how to prioritize? And this is, some would argue, a classic triage situation. Uh, 
Um, and the way the act was set up uh, and has played out over the years is that that judgment has largely been driven by citizen petitions and lawsuits. Essentially, Congress uh, believed it when it crafted the ESA and the major environmental statutes back in the 1970s in the, uh, the citizen um, enforcement model of environmental protection, one that has not been copied that many times around the globe. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, government, when it violates the law, is not going to be so self-correcting. We need uh, essentially citizen watchdogs to help that. Uh, help the, uh, with the implementation of the law. And so that's the way it's worked on the Endangered Species Act. Much controversy over these citizen petitions and, list, and listing petitions, and particularly from even the more progressive wildlife agency officials, uh, whatever administration, they're generally unhappy with having their discretion to make those kinds of prioritization decisions taken away from them by citizens who file petitions and lawsuits. Uh, so you know, the real question I would put to those agency folks, well, if you don't like the citizens' priority choices, what are your priority choices? And we have not really had that national conversation. And there's many different ways you could uh, have that conversation. Maybe species conservation is all about ecosystem services. And the most important species to save are the ones that will help provide the drinking water, the flood protection, et cetera, the medicines. Or maybe it's all about which species are the most charismatic or the ones that are potentially harvestable and providing recreational value. Um, that conversation has never happened in this country, but effectively there is a triage prioritization process that happens behind the scenes without a lot of order to it. Um, similarly, uh, critical habitat, this is a thorny part of the act, one that is very controversial at any time to put, draw any lines on a map suggesting that land use measures, uh, regulations might apply there. Um, so, um, it gets more controversial if you, add, if you follow the science and say, all right, well, the critical habitat for this species is now going to be further toward the poles and further upslope. And maybe that's not the historic range of the species, but that's what the future range is going to be and how comfortable people are going to be able to seeing those lines on the map. Um, that's, again, uh, issues that the political process has not yet grappled with. I'm on now on the second major feature of the Act, which is protecting those remaining populations. And here are some of the key provisions of the Act that I'm referring to. The take prohibition of Section 9 and 4D, the jeopardy, the, which applies to federal and non-federal actors. Uh, the second and third ones I'm listing here, the jeopardy uh, provision uh, and the prohibition against adverse modification of critical habitat. Those are the ones that apply just to federal agencies, but they impact people who rely upon the federal agencies for permits or funding. So the real question is, are those designed to solve the big challenges of the day? Well, right now we have this enormous task of reevaluating everything um, in terms of what species needs. Uh, there are these climate models that are coming out in, in rapid pace now. They're taking the big global circulation models that were discussed in the IPCC reports in terms of what the future climate looks like and starting to downscale them now to particular locations and saying, here's what your future climate looks like. Then you bring the ecologists in and say, here's what your future landscape looks like. And then you have the people who are expert in vulnerability assessments that are saying, all right, now in light of that future climate, that future landscape conditions, here are the species that are most likely to be in need. Here are the species that are likely to be arriving. Here are the ones that are likely to be departing. And you need to solve how to change your management strategy in light of all that new information. Um, barely begun to happen across the natural resource agencies. Uh, but they, they're trying. There is a sincere effort that's happening right now in the discussion. We're, we're heavily engaged in training and, and uh, working through these issues with a lot of the agencies. Um, habitat connectivity becomes absolutely crucial because you think about all species are now on the move in light of this, the climate signals that are being sent to them, so we need to facilitate that movement. So thinking about those wildlife crossings under highways, uh, the many other ways, the culverts, uh, that we can facilitate uh, wildlife movement, we need to be prioritizing. Uh, Going back to my point about hydrology earlier, I think Endangered Species Act has a crucial role, as well as the other conservation laws, have a crucial role into dealing with some of the most extreme impacts of climate change, which is the water scarcity and the overabundance of water, the flooding and the flood damage. Uh, and finally, um, there's only so many planning meetings I'm willing to go to, and so many planning meetings that the, the government is willing to invest in. So the real question is, how can we integrate this endangered species ecosystem-oriented planning for climate with the other kinds of uh, planning for climate that's underway, major efforts underway in the insurance industry, uh, coastal cities and the like that are trying to protect their infrastructure and their assets at risk from climate change. And the real question is, are we going to have an integrated strategy that protects nature as well as those physical assets? And that's going to be one of the big challenges for the endangered species gurus to, be, to become part of that conversation.
All right, I'm now on the third major feature of the Endangered Species Act. I think I'm about close to winding down for those who are worried about that. Um, recovery. The ultimate goal of the act, it's stated fairly clearly, is to get the act out of the way ultimately for all these species that are listed. Um, and here are some of the provisions that talk about the mechanisms by which we will do that. So not only are we going to protect as much of the remaining populations, but we're going to think about expanding populations, numbers, expanding habitat areas that the species can occupy. And I'm not going to read these, but that gives you a flavor of the key recovery provisions. So some of the issues that the uh, changing world we live in raises, from, in my mind, on how we achieve recovery and delisting. What the science is making pretty clear is that the old model, which you see particularly in some countries like in South Africa and Botswana, which is you take a big circle around a map and you call it the protected park and say that is our nation's wildlife conservation strategy. Uh, and we do, do that in this country, right? We create our wildlife refuges, many of which for endangered species conservation purposes. Um, that is an outmoded model because everything is on the move. And uh, that uh, little photo I have on the bottom right is the world we're going to be living in, the world of extreme weather events. And uh, somebody needs to come in after those extreme weather events and rebuild a habitat or rebuild some uh, homes. And those kinds of judgments and those kinds of investments are very substantial. The Endangered Species Act, although it has this broad notion of endangered species recovery. It doesn't provide a dime of funding for that kind of work. Uh, it re relies upon an annual appropriation of Congress. Um, and if you look at what Congress does for the Endangered Species Act on an annual basis, it's a pittance compared to what the need is. And, and what I'm suggesting here is the need will only grow uh, for management restoration measures. Uh, you know, it's hard enough to essentially draw that protect line around a map and say this is your protected area. And you, here, uh, wildlife refuge manager, make sure nobody comes in and cuts trees down. Uh, the real question is, what do you do when the monster Category 5 storm cuts the trees down. Uh, and, uh, uh, we don't have a strategy yet on restoration. I had the uh, experience of being down in New Orleans six months after Katrina. Um, we had our, already had our organization's annual meeting scheduled for New Orleans, and we didn't want to bail out in the city. We felt like spending our money in the city was an important thing to do at that point. But we organized major habitat restorations uh, across the refuges and parks in the, in the area. All of our volunteers and board members and staff who came in for the meeting helped out. And it is very, very time-consuming, painstaking work, ripping out these Chinese tallow plants, which are the invasives that rush in whenever you have a shock like saltwater intrusion across a, a, a brackish or freshwater system, one by one ripping out these plants and then trying to replant something that would be uh, suitable for the new climate. So that's the kind of conservation I foresee uh, becoming uh, crucial if we want to pass our natural heritage on to future generations very intensive hands-on management restoration. And the question is, is our endangered species law, other major conservation laws up to the task? And I guess my main me uh, message I want to leave you with is we do a lot of work with campuses. We do a lot of work with young people. I, I'm not sure, you know, I don't, we don't have the resources to do polling every single day, but we pay pretty close attention to polls and focus groups. There is a very powerful interest, particularly in the younger generation in this country, uh, in addressing the big sustainability challenges facing this country and the planet. Uh, I'm really optimistic about that. And, but most of the energy is around the concepts, and maybe because climate change has been whooping us upside the head so much in the recent years, in clean energy and sustainability. Rarely in the meetings that I go to are the conversations framed in terms of wildlife. Um, and to me, that's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, sustainability is one of those words that tries to capture the whole suite of things we need to do to save the planet. Um, but I, I see right now we're at this key moment where uh, those of us who care about wildlife can help people understand how it is an integral part of that equation. Uh, when you talk about green jobs, it's not just install, installing solar panels. Uh, it's about restoration uh, of uh, natural communities. Uh, and so uh, that's where I'm suggesting we're at right now in terms of a historic moment. It's almost sort of like back to the core principles and grassroots uh, uh, mobilization around why we have conservation laws and what we need from our conservation laws. Uh, I, I, in previous sessions, I've wrapped up by giving some kind of call to action on some major piece of statute. But this time, I think I'm going to sort of leave with that thought um, that uh, we have this big opportunity right now to design a sustainability agenda that has wildlife as a pretty key part of it. Let me stop. Thank you, John. Uh
anybody has questions, you would you like a sheet of paper, or you could also just uh, raise your hand. The main thing is uh, we want the people on the phones to hear your questions, so maybe John or Diana, you could just repeat the question. So uh, either way is fine. Anybody want to shoot a paper? Okay, well, I'll start off with a, one question that I do have. And that question is, has the interpretation and implementation of NEPA varied substantially with different uh, presidential administrations? Not at its core at all. NEPA, has, NEPA and the NEPA process has been remarkably unaffected by changes in administrations. NEPA has only been amended once, which was in 1974, to allow uh, state highway agencies to repair EISs. And the regulations that were issued by CEQ in 1979 have only been amended once, and that was to delete the term worst case analysis and substitute high, low probability catastrophic impacts. Kind of a wordier way of saying the same thing. Um, but uh, the fundamental direction of um, implementation has not changed because of administrations. It has changed in ways that have little to do with policy direction and much more to do with budget. When I started with the agencies in 1981, there was uh, considerable and more in-house resources to actually do the NEPA process, uh, including preparation of the documents by the agencies themselves. Most of that now has left, <laughs> gone. Um, that is equally, been equally as true in um, Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, there's just been a steady decline with every administration in in-house resources, and so contractors end up doing much more of the work. Um, in my mind, even though there are many wonderful contractors out there, um, that's not a great development, but it's not a, it was not a product of any kind of partisan direction, and it's been more in the budget cuts. Um, but there have been some other long-running trends or um, issues, for example, the application of NEPA to federal actions abroad. The players and the positions have remained remarkably consistent since May of 1970, um, regardless of the administration, unaffected by mm. the administration and, and very much part of institutional profiles within the executive branch. So um, there are some, it, well, I'll just leave it at that. Very little of that. I think oh. it's for both of you. Oh, okay. Alright, I'll read it and then uh, I'll take give a short uh, version of an answer and Diana can backfill. How about that? How has NEPA and ESA influenced broader international environmental standards and national laws? Okay. What are the areas for improvement regarding international support and implementation. I'll give a brief answer on ESA because I think I alluded to this earlier. I think it has uh, the concept of an endangered species law was a new one in the early 1970s, and that concept has been repeated in uh, many countries around the world. Uh, but we have a fairly unique system that maybe Australia is the only one, and I'd be interested to know if Donna would, would want to correct me on this, that actually has sort of the level of citizen engagement and involvement as the Endangered Species Act in this country has. So to me, uh, you do have pretty broad statements of commitments to endangered species conservation from many of the countries around the world. Many uh, have uh, signed on to the Biodiversity Convention and ratified it. Uh, and that's a pretty broadly supported uh, treaty. Uh, the U.S., uh, that's to our chagrin, has not done that. Um, and so I do think the Endangered Species Act gets credit uh, for perpetrating this notion that you ought to have a national policy to conserve your endangered species, uh, though I think the mechanism by which the Endangered Species Act have been implemented have not been copied in that many places in terms of really allowing citizens to sort of participate in petitioning for getting species protected and holding the government's feet to this fire and that sort of thing. In terms of NEPA, I already mentioned that in other countries have, uh, actually I think a bit more by now, have adopted a NEPA-like statute. Um, some of them do come with the ability to litigate. I already mentioned the Philippines case that goes farther than any U.S. court has done. But most, in most countries, there's simply less litigation. And in some countries, not really the potential for litigation that there is in the United States. But I think the administrative process of environmental impact assessment, as it's generally known on the global scale, has had a, a tremendous impact. It's included as a feature of a number of international treaties. Um, 
including treaties or international agreements that by themselves require environmental impact assessment. That's the point of it, like the ESPU Convention uh, with the European Union that includes transboundary environmental impact assessment. Um, other statutes which have other focuses but include a requirement for environmental impact assessment. Uh, it's also been used as a model for other areas. For example, I'm serving right now on a National Academy panel on health impact assessment, which is something that is only now getting some currency in the United States, but was modeled after environmental impact assessment after NEPA and is required by the European Union and is also um, an active process in Australia, New Zealand, and Thailand, and other places around the world. So I think, generally speaking, the administrative process and to some extent the legal process has had tremendous um, international influence. I have a question on the ESA here. Um, do we have any sort of ESA-related agreements with Canada uh, for listed species that are increasingly appearing north of the border? Are there contingency plans? This should be a short one. <laughs> uh, the answer is no. In fact, I think this is a great question for somebody who wants to write a paper or start a career. Uh, I think it's essential, um, and not just for Canada, but for more and more countries who share uh, land uh, crossings uh, to work on. I know there's enormous challenges with our Mexican border in light of the border fence that we're building. Uh, and so, and I think there's also, you know, you really can't project which direction species will move in. It was really a little bit, a little bit simplistic for me to say, you know, suggest that like this is steady march northward toward the poles. Um, so I think in both directions we need um, agreements to facilitate uh, species movement. Certainly for those who are concerned about the future of the wolf in the northeastern U.S., uh, some pretty rough sledding for the wolves to get down from Quebec down to Maine. Uh, which you know was historically a uh, major ha uh, area of habitat for the wolves uh, and now rarely sighted uh, because no one's facilitating a conversation with Canadian land, uh, with particular uh, Quebec Quebecois uh, landowners. Uh, so, that, and that's just one example of many uh, where we really could be doing much for wildlife conservation by facilitating that transboundary conversation. Yeah, I would just emphasize again that it's not just the U.S. Canadian border. Mm -hmm. I heard a report just a couple of weeks ago that there's 14 jaguars uh, within 100 miles of the U.S.-Mexican border. Um, we are building a border wall. We actually already have about 670 miles of it. We have waived all environmental laws, all environmental laws, federal, state, and local, for construction of that. There is a bill in front of Congress right now that would waive all environmental laws for all border security activities within 100 miles inland of all U.S. And land and maritime borders of the United States, covering 10 states completely. Um, this is not a feature if you're a jaguar <laughs> trying to cross into the United States, and that we are uh, really headed toward a, a, a real crisis there. Uh, next question, which is one that uh, John and I should also share. Why was there a large bipartisan support for NEPA and ESA <laughs> But it was passed, I assume there's the implication here. But today we see a partisan divide on the environment, specifically with climate change legislation. We actually see a partisan divide on the environment in just about every aspect. Not certainly climate change is the biggest, but on everything. I mean, I mentioned the Antiquities Act this morning. Uh, laws that go back to our end, to, to antiquity almost. Um, there has there has been a huge, huge shift. Um, the nature of the Republican Party has frankly changed a great deal. When I started in Washington, many of the leading um, environmental advocates in Congress were Republicans. Um, none of them are there anymore. I, it would take a very long amount of time to dissect why that has happened in its entirety. I do think it's, uh, first of all, I think it's fair to say that probably none of these laws would pass today. Um, but many people have also said that it's probably the case that the Bill of Rights would never pass today, uh, particularly the First Amendment. Um, and this is true. There's been a lot of polls showing that. Um, we have gotten more conservative as a country. There's no question about it. I also think there was not a understanding of how tough a lot of these issues were going to be, that it was, it was um, a good thing to do in the early 1970s, but there was an assumption that it was going to be easier than it's turned out to be, and that it wasn't going to bore anybody's ox, so to speak, that it wasn't going to have, um, it wasn't going to threaten any companies or anybody's way of life, um, and that has not proven to be the case. And so, John, you may want to add some thoughts to that. 
How many hours do we have? Just kidding. <laughs> right, exactly. This is like a book or several books. <laughs> but yeah. It's certainly, it's a factor that we deal with every day. Yeah, it's really hard to give a concise, uh, simple answer to this question because it goes to well beyond environmental laws and what's happened to our political system. Um, and if you're somebody who really cares about advancing, what I was suggesting in my talk, we need to update our conservation thinking, update our conservation laws to deal with the major challenges facing today. There can be nothing more depressing than the, the news about the way our Congress uh, functions today. In uh, uh, there's just no uh, sincere effort for people to come together to roll up their sleeves and solve these problems. Um, and um, it relates to partisan politics, but it also relates to uh, the incredible infusion of special interest money in Congress, which goes beyond Republicans and has infected a significant number of Democrats as well. Uh, the, the recent Supreme Court ruling in Citizens United should really frighten you if you care about the future of our environmental laws. Uh, because uh, not only is there lots of money coming into the system, it's uh, increasingly undisclosed money, uh, so nobody can be held accountable for who, what money they're taking from whom. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, people who are very fearful about change, who are making lots of money under the existing system, and, uh, you know, as a general rule of thumb, business people like certainty. And uh, particularly the more retrograde business people who don't know how to do the, the sort of uh, uh, planning uh, and understanding of the world's changes and want to lock in a vision that was in their mind when they started 20, 30 years ago. I, I think there's a really significant generational thing happening here. When I look at this, you know, the, the hearing on the tar sands pipeline, for example, that we had recently, uh, which is the worst kind of crude from global warming perspective that's uh, proposed for uh, a pi uh, sending down from Alberta down through the middle of our country. And you look at the audience in that crowd, and these, you know, thousand dollar an hour lawyers, the, the, these old dinosaurs. Uh, I'm sorry, but, you know, I hate to be. <laughs> and these people, have, you know, their frame of reference for the world was formed 40 years ago based upon the notions that Dinah was suggesting, which is that they can have it all. It's a limitless world. Uh, you know, free markets meant, you know, uh, take whatever you can get and the world will be fine. Uh, we've since learned that uh, there's significant questions of carrying capacity on this planet and that we have to think about how to share resources. And uh, they're not in that world frame. And if they're not in that frame, I don't know how to change their minds. Uh, so, uh, and to me, that's not a Republican-Democrat issue. Uh, it obviously is a bigger problem than the Republican Party. We can't find environmental champions like we once used to, but uh, it's well beyond that as, as a challenge. And so I uh, would love to work with you all in solving it, but no easy answers in that one. A related question. What's your opinion about the recent uh, delisting of the gray wolf in the budget bill? So that was not the entire gray wolf, but it was the Northern Rockies population of the gray wolf. And even that is a sort of a subpopulation of the well, gray wolf in some of the states, but not all, because Wyoming will not get delisted until the Fish and Wildlife Service says so. Uh, that's another very complicated story. Uh, we're not happy about it at all. Uh, Congress basically, for the first time in the history of the Endangered Species Act, took uh, at least a part of a species off of the list based upon political considerations. Um, when the, the act always envisioned that it would be a scientific decision made by wildlife agencies without any congressional role. Uh, so it's a big problem. Uh, it's a long, complicated story of how we got there. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service basically made a decision that they wanted these species off the list. Conservation, some conservation groups sued them. Uh, didn't look like the litigation was ever going to get going to get resolved. And. Um, there are members of Congress from that region whose interest was to uh, get the species off the list, uh, one of whom is up for election next year, um, and uh, uh, was able to make it happen. Um, I guess the only point I can make about that is somebody who actually has litigated a fair amount in my career is if you litigate a case, you have to also be able to win on the politics. It's not enough to win in court. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> But sometimes courts are the only venue where you can change things. The next right. question, which is also for both of us, is in the rush to develop alternative renewable energy sources, how effective will NEPA and the ESA be at balancing individual species and habitat protection with political and economic pressures to develop, for example, large-scale wind and solar farms? Um, I think it will be reasonably effective, um, not always effective. I think it will be basically no more, and this is a huge generality of course, but no less or more effective than it has been with other kinds of energy development. We have already seen one large uh, solar uh, project, I've forgotten how many acres, but a huge solar project in the California desert where most of them seem to be, uh, enjoined by a port. Um, and 
we are starting to see more litigation as more of these ripen. There hasn't, I mean, they've, they've been in the administrative process. They're starting to come out of that. We will see more uh, litigation. Um, Defenders has just filed a suit and other groups will be. And I don't think the courts are going to give them a pass just because it's all alternative energy. They, that's not to say that the agencies are gonna lose all these cases. Agencies win most need the cases. Um, but occasionally they do lose and when they lose it. Make a huge difference. So, you want to say anything about the essay? Uh, well, um, other than to say uh, it's a crowded world, uh, <laughs> and uh, we do need a place to cite our energy uh, sources. Um, we are my organization is a very, very strong supporter of building out uh, wind and solar as a replacement for fossil fuels in this country. Uh, we want to find as many ways to get meet our energy supply through so-called megawatts, which is conservation uh, and, and efficiency measures, which have zero habitat impact. Uh, the next best step is uh, distributed uh, forms of renewables, which is wind and solar where people live. Uh, and then the next step is to look at large scale out into the open spaces. And ideally, uh, in that situation, you look for the areas that are most degraded and have least habitat value. Um, and so. Uh, there is a way to build the clean energy future without taking wildlife down with it, and we're working to find that. So. And every group I know supports that kind of approach, uh, certainly very much including defenders. The, um, unfortunately, there tends to be a lot of kind of desert prejudice, so to speak, as somebody who grew up around the California desert, and uh, I think a lot of people actually think that there is not any real valuable resources in the desert. The case that uh, did result in the, the solar um, energy case that resulted in an injunction actually was brought by a tribe. Um, it's not always the case that environmental cases are brought by, quote, environmental organizations, but it became very clear in the course of the opinion that the that judge concluded that the uh, Federal Land Management Agency, in that case the Bureau of Land Management, had simply not respected the government-to-government -government relationship consultation requirements with the tribe um, that was going to be quite directly affected by the solar project. Any more questions? Um, hi, I, I wanted to ask John specifically about um, what you see as the Fish and Wildlife Service's role through the ESA handling climate change because both uh, Salazar and Nominee Ash have basically reassured Congress that ESA will not be the tool mm -hmm. for regulating greenhouse gases. Right. So do you see them mostly doing it with listing decisions and critical habitat designations? I'll, I'll be happy repeat it, yeah. I'll see if I can paraphrase. Uh, so the question was uh, how I felt the administration, particularly the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Interior Department, will deal with climate change in the context of the Endangered Species Act. Will they regulate greenhouse gas emissions? Will they deal with it in listing critical habitat decisions? Um, so I think the most important thing to distinguish is will they deal with the impacts of climate change or will they try attempt to deal with the sources of the carbon pollution that leads to climate change as well as ocean acidification? Um, and I think the answer is fairly clear and you saw it with uh, uh, nominee Ash's response to a letter from uh, Mr. Inhofe, the ranking member on the Environment Committee on the Senate, uh, that the, they will not attempt to use the Endangered Species Act as a way of regulating carbon pollution or greenhouse gas emissions. And actually, if you, if you thought, saw my uh, presentation and the number of references I made to climate change, I am a major believer in using the act to deal with the impacts of climate change. I think that will take enormous resources that don't currently exist. I think we need to find those resources. And then on top of that, to find the resources for the agency to deal with tailpipes and power plant emissions and the many, 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 many other sources, our entire economy's sources of greenhouse gas emissions, I share the view that they should not be diverting resources to that. I think there's plenty to do on just dealing with uh, the habitat destruction and that, that results from, uh, from climate change and the many other threats. So uh, I, I know some, there's us other conservation groups that actually want to force that issue and get the, the service in the business of regulating greenhouse gas emissions. EPA has got that job. They've stepped up to it. I think one of the most important things we can do right now to help with climate change is to back up the EPA and uh, carrying out the Clean Air Act authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And to me, to send a wildlife agency that has so little clout and so little technical expertise into that business would be a huge mistake. Are there any limitations on Congress's ability to legislate around or alter NEPA analysis in specific bills? Um, 
this comes with several kind of variations on the theme. There is no limitation on Congress's ability to eliminate environmental laws completely, as in the border uh, <coughs> issues. Um, it's not a constitutional provision. Congress, of course, makes all the laws. They can repeal them. Um, and there are a number of bills to do that, uh, whether it's um, uh, changing the law substantively, eliminating the application of a whole class of laws like environmental laws for everything, all border activities within 100 miles of a border, or eliminating an agency's ability to, to look at, analyze certain issues under laws. For example, there's a bill that would eliminate all the uh, federal agency's ability to analyze or address climate change under all environmental laws, whether it's NEPA, ESA, or Clean Air Act, or anything else. So um, there are no, generally speaking, there are no barriers on that. There is a caveat in that if there's been a judicial opinion in a particular case, there are constitutional issues that can inhibit and have in prevented Congress from overturning a case that's already been decided. Um, and that played out in a NEPA case called the Alaska Wilderness Recreation and Tourist Alliance uh, versus the Forest Service in Alaska where um, the, uh, there were two 40-year timber contracts on the Tongass National Forest because just as we encouraged expansion and settlement in the mainland of the United States, the United States government decided to subsidize the logging of timber in southeast Alaska, fearing that it wouldn't happen if they didn't subsidize it. So they gave what remained by uh, the late 1990s the only 40-year <coughs> contracts, I think, in the entire U.S. government. Um, and Forest Service sales were uh, geared toward meeting the demands of those contracts. When those contracts were broken, because in fact there's a huge problem with um, selling timber coming out of Southeast Alaska for a variety of reasons, when those contracts were broken, um, plaintiffs went to court and said, well, they need to redo the NEPA analysis because the circumstances have changed. They no longer need to meet the contractual demands. And the court said, you're right. And Ted Stevens said, think again. <laughs> and um, pass a provision in an appropriations bill that attempted to overturn that. And the Ninth Circuit said, no, you can't. And said, you know, we're the last word for a particular case once we've decided it. That doesn't mean, however, as the court opinion pointed out, that Congress can't change the law before a case is decided and therefore um, change the outcome of the case. Uh, the only thing that could really make it different in the broad picture, not related to specific cases in court, um, would be a constitutional amendment. And my personal prediction, not shared by any organization I know, <laughs> is that by the end of this century, we will have a constitutional amendment on the environment. Um, I don't think I will be alive to see it. I'm not sure if the youngest person in this room will be, but, um, but I think, if nothing else, driven by the exigencies of climate change, we will at some point have to get a lot, not only serious, but a lot more serious than we've ever dreamed of in this area. You've got another question? I have to, oh, I have another one here, okay. I'm gonna say I have to answer that too, that's too hard. Uh, God, this is gonna require glasses when he stays. Right, bigger next time, folks. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to let me pull, no, I'll, I'll pull out my glasses. Admit, you know, this is necessary these days. I'm really sorry to say. Conservation based on individual species is not proven to be an efficient model for species recovery and habitat restoration. What opportunity do you see in the landscape scale for conservation in future uh, ESA policy, landscape scale conservation in future ESA policy. I disagree with the premise of the question, that there's a difference. Um, I think we need landscape scale conservation policy. We need big picture thinking. We need to think about the amount of space that many species will need in the long term, particularly to move. We need to think about the large spaces that water needs to move and plants need to move. Uh, but we can never stop paying attention to species. Species are the most measurable indicator of whether we're making progress on the environment, perhaps next to water, water quantity and water quality. Uh, and so I've heard this question for as long as I've been involved in the Endangered Species Act. When are we going to get away from individual species management and start doing real landscape scale management? And to me, that's a false trade-off. Uh, we have to do both. I mean, it's costly, it's hard, but we can't, we can't do one or the other. Uh, now, if your point is, can we find ways to create some efficiencies so when we have, you know, eight listed species on a single landscape, that when we make a decision, we're thinking about all those eight species as well as the ones that may be heading toward uh, listing? Absolutely. 
but that's not the same thing as saying we're moving away from a species focus onto a habitat level or a landscape level because uh, we absolutely need those species. Uh, first, we need those species because they have a right to evolve and to exist, but we also need them because uh, we won't know how well we're doing unless we uh, measure their trends, status and trends. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, that's an excellent question because. Okay. Sure, please. Um, Oh, I'll give the example. Okay, so the, uh, a very good question. Uh, what is the uh, the connection to ESA and industrial agriculture? And uh, some examples. Um, that's a really good question because under other major environmental laws, industrial agriculture has led, largely gotten a free pass. Um, and so um, people who are worried about the impact of industrial agriculture on our environment, and you should be, um, probably want to know, is the Endangered Species Act a potential tool to help address some of those abuses? Um, so industrial agriculture has a lot of impacts on the environment. The one that I think about most is just the application of uh, pre pesticides and fertilizers. Um, and of course, there's also CAFOs, so you have all the manure and the, the waste that spills onto the land. And so there are water quality impacts predominantly. I'm sure there are others. But that's the ones that come to mind for me. And the Endangered Species Act has um, uh, led to the listing of many aquatic species. And probably most of the aquatic species that are listed in the Endangered Species Act, one of the threats is uh, water quality. Um, and then the real question is, is, well, what tool would the Endangered Species Act provide to limit the harm that a large farming concern might cause to water quality? Um, the most prominent example in my mind is pesticides. Um, there has been a wave of litigation in the past 10 or so years uh, essentially to force EPA to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service and Marine Fisheries Service on the impacts of pesticide registrations to endangered species. The result of that, um, particularly in the Pacific Northwest where the greatest amount of progress has been made, is that there are new rules being created about pesticide applications on the land uh, requiring buffers along streams to make sure that pesticides aren't directly applied into water bearing salmon. Uh, that has caused major consternation on the part of industrial agriculture who is not accustomed to being regulated by environmental laws. And there are proposals constantly being put forward. One was put forward administratively by the Bush administration back in Dinah's day. Um, <laughs> and we were able to stop that, got overturned in court. We were, the National Wildlife Federation was a party of that case. Um, and uh, there have been uh, put forward in Congress, and we've so far been able to hold them off. Um, but the potential is pretty significant to um, find ways, the direct connections between damage to aquatic species and industrial agriculture. And so uh, there are potentially other uh, connections. Last point I would make on that is um, regulations will only get you so far. Uh, there's also a host of incentive programs that have been created under the Endangered Species Act, some involving funding, some uh, such as a safe harbor program that basically says if you do something helpful to species, it won't lead to more regulation. Uh, and those have actually been play, applied on the, uh, 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 agricultural lands around the country with a fair amount of success. Uh, but when I think about impacts to the environment, and that typically works with bird species and terrestrial species. Um, on the, uh, but you know, the most endangered classes of species in this country tend to be the aquatics, the freshwater aquatics. Uh, and not just freshwater, let's look at the dead zones <laughs> in the Chesapeake Bay and the Gulf of Mexico, so saltwater aquatics as well. Uh, and so the Endangered Species Act is just starting to get a toehold on that. There's probably a lot more work to be done. I think uh, uh, we're at the end of our seminar. Thank you, Dinah and John, and, and stay tuned for the rest of the series. Again, if you want to listen to this later, we're recording it and videotaping it, and uh, you can check our public archives. You can email the link to anybody you know, and uh, it's a great educational tool that we'll have, we'll have up for at least a year. And uh, stay tuned for the rest of this um, summer series. In June and July, there's a career session, the very last session on July 20th. Uh, so we hope to see you again, and thanks very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you.